Hello and welcome to another episode of Restation Station. I'm your host, Alan Weimar. Today I'm with David Hewitt. I think that's how you say it, right? I forgot to ask that, you. That's exactly correct, yes. Wow, I'm good at this. Maybe because I spent a couple of days in UK, I'm able to pick up the, the names. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But he is a maintainer. I don't know how many maintainers there are. There must be quite a few of Pio3, I think the very famous Python Rust library. Everybody got into Rust from this one. Did you guys make this library just to get people into Rust? Because a lot of people get into <laughs> Python, and then they discover Pio3, and then they become Rust fanatics, right? Is that what happened to you too? Interesting question. So actually, I guess there is an, a bit of that, but that wasn't really the primary focus of it, at least not for me. So I come from having used libraries like PyBind 11, which is a C++ library in the past to do the same kind of stuff from Python, connecting C++ to Python. So it's really the big performance advantages, but also like I have a thing for, I guess, compiled code. I like that kind of ahead of time reliability, if you like. And so for me, the interest on Pio3 was having seen the same thing before, but also like I'd found Rust as a language before that and been like, hey, I want to be interested in contributing to the open source ecosystem for Rust. And Pio3 felt like a natural fit where I eventually found a home. So I can't speak for the original author of Pio3 who made the fork. I don't know how, how much you know about the history of Pio3, actually. I don't know much, actually, because I've mm. made it my, I think you've already noticed, I made my voice very clear. I'm not a big fan of Python. Oh, uh, yes. I don't know I why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. I think it's, one of my experiences with Python was, first of all, I'm a mostly a Ruby guy, so I think that's part of it. Ruby and Python mm. guys is kind of like Windows and Mac. They always fight mm -hmm. each other, right? The other thing, too, is I had an issue that really made me upset, which was I was using, I think, soft spaces, and I think my boss was using tabs, and we had some conflict of spacing, mm. which was mm. a huge blow to me. I was like, really? This is what's going to kill me in? And I think older versions of Python as well, like it literally just said syntax error, and it doesn't even tell you what's gone wrong. It would just crash I out. Forget, I forget. This was like over 10 years ago now. It must mm, be uh, yeah, yeah. even longer, maybe. But yeah, so it was just like not a fun experience. and. I think I just had more fun with Ruby, and so I just saw anything else as just kind of, you know, I don't know, a threat. <laughs> I don't know mm. how I would to say it. And, and also, I always heard it's beautiful, right? But in my opinion, like, I think the double underscores everywhere is for when you do, like, mm. the init, when you have these, they're called magic methods, you know, mm. like, defining len. I thought it was very weird that you would define len with the double underscore, and then you could finally yep. use len. It's like, well, but I can just call double underscore len, so why not just use dot len? Why do I have to use len? I felt weird about that. I think there's kind of like an interesting jewel with like trace implementations in Rust actually is how I kind of think about those things like Len. It's a very similar kind of way, but maybe they're also referring to the white space and the way that you don't have too many like symbolic yeah. clutterings. Then you have do and end, right? Or if you want to, I think Ruby's got do and end. So that's mm. their, their way of kind of doing rid of the curly braces, which is what everybody wants to get rid of, right? Unless you're Rust, which I'm quite happy with curly braces, to be honest. I'm going to say some positive things about Python so people don't think I'm 100% <laughs> against it, right? I do like the list comprehensions. I like that one. So mm. I'm a big fan of CoffeeScript. Too bad CoffeeScript has kind of lost its flavor, but it's a lot of the good stuff about Python within CoffeeScript. Like the list comprehension is really cool. Mm -hmm. I think the for loop is pretty nice. I'm trying to think what else. There's a couple other things I like too. I think the lambdas are okay. It's that style. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's just a lot of stuff that I, maybe it's just, I need to just do it more. But I actually, I worked full time with Python for over a year in finance. Mm -hmm. So you can't say I've never touched it. I just used it for a while and I'm aware of the weirdness. But yeah. what I really don't like is the magic behind, when I say magic, right? Usually Python people say there's too much magic in Ruby. But when you mm -hmm. import a module and some guy thinks it's funny to put a bunch of code within the init file, yeah, then you're like, oh, what the heck is running? <laughs> what just happened, right? That's the stuff I feel a little bit freaky about. But Ruby can also do weird stuff where you can bring a class in that overrides stuff. And so no language is perfect, right? Mm. I feel like that kind of sort of evils of the init files, I guess if you're thinking of things like monkey patching as well, right, where people are making shenanigans and modifying functions in other classes. Well, I think a lot of that yeah. kind of practice has died out with type checkers and MyPy. If you realize that it's actually quite hard to express that kind of thing going on, if you've got a type checker telling you, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't really be touching that attribute, and it kind of catches and weans out all of that behavior. Well, for me, actually, I also did OpenERP, which I think changed your name recently to something else. I forgot. But have you ever heard of OpenERP before or no? It's an ERP Not system written totally in Python, I, they, unless they changed something. I worked also for over a year with OpenERP, which is all written in Python. And the reason I thought about it is because monkey patching. 
whenever we wanted to extend something in a current module from another piece of code, we would have to monkey patch it. Mm, so that's yeah. why I thought about right now is like, oh yeah, I remember actually that was actually one of the nice things was actually monkey patching stuff because that's the only way you can ever <laughs> extend something was to monkey patch it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that as a recommended practice. I, well, that's what they told me, right? I just follow whatever my boss told me. I'm not an expert mm -hmm. in this stuff, but that's what we used to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So yeah, the, the reason why I brought up the uh, the history of Pi3 is because it's actually kind of like an interesting topic, I think, from the, the Rust ecosystem perspective. So it started as a fork of another project, Rust C Python, which is much simpler, like kind of like it follows kind of the typical Rust way to bind to some other library. So it's got like Python sys crates that provide an FFI layer. And it's got, I think, different versions of that for each of the different versions. So like 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, sys, they all exist. And then Pi3 got forked as a way to do this more friendly using, say, proc macros, especially for the purpose of interacting with Python classes. And the, the person who did this was the same person who created Actix Web. And so Actix Web is obviously, it's a really successful project, but it's also had the famous like explosion for unsafe code creating like a big storm on Reddit, right, a few years ago. And so I feel like Pi3 is kind of sitting on the same story, but just nobody's really picked it up in the same way. And that was actually one of the things that I got really involved in when I first picked up Pi3 was I was looking at it and going, okay, am I really sure that all these things going on here are definitely sound? And I definitely cleaned up. A number of unsafe like pieces of the code if you like and i would go so far as to claim that these days uh it's safe and you shouldn't be concerned when using pi3 uh because i've obviously spent a lot of time looking very carefully at it but yeah it's just got that interesting backstory to it not to fault um this guy i think his name's nicolay kim i'm not sure if i can name it right but because obviously he's done a really great thing building both these projects and coming up with this like these proc macro apis i think it's really helped shape the rust ecosystem so I'm not wanting to bash on him. It's just a kind of connection that might be interesting. So when you say Actix Web is also Actix, right? The same guy who did Actix, because I know that mm. Actix Web has kind of shifted away from Actix. It's kind of his own yeah. thing. Yeah. I'm not sure how much let remains of the original Actix project, to be honest, is it? It's just Actix Web, really, that yeah. still exists. As Nobody far really as I talks know. about Actix anymore, which I thought was quite interesting because they made a big deal about the stuff that, well, I mean, people had their opinions about it, right? Actix mm. and how the code should be. But so the guy who wrote Actix is the guy who also wrote, who started Actix Web, same person, also did Pi03. So okay. maybe I should have explained that a little bit more clearly. So Rust C Python had ways for you to create Python extension modules from Rust. And so this is a practice that, you know, people have done this in C. They've done this in C++. I mentioned PyBind11 as one of the C++ options earlier. You can kind of do the same trick with a thing called Siphon, which is sort of like a C-like, Python-like language. All of these end up compiling code, which then when you do your import, as you mentioned earlier, that runs weird stuff, one of the weird stuff it can do is it can load a, a native library, which then creates a whole load of classes and functions for you that you can run from your Python. And so Rust C Python has a way to do this using the Rust's rules by example, or the macro rules, which some people really love, some people really hate, the like pattern matchy way of creating Python classes. And it's quite hard to maintain that stuff, especially for complex stuff, and forces you into certain compromises. So definitely the proc macros that Pi03 uses, which is, I guess, the main reinvention of Pi03 as a fork over Rust C Python, really made it much nicer to use as an API. And I think that's why people have gravitated to Pi03 over time. That plus actually really good documentation. So I think that's something that Nikolai Kam was really good at for Actix as well. Like, there were good docs as a good base, so people came to it and started using it because they could see how to get going with it. And so, again, the Pi3 docs have been something that we've built up and up over time. I think they're quite a useful resource that kind of helps people get going now. Sorry, I want to go back to the creator, right? Mm -hmm. So he stopped working on Pi03 at the same time of Actix. I think he just kind of stepped back from everything. Is that what actually happened, or do you keep working on Pi03 for a while, or do you don't know? So I think it's probably before all of that, that he stepped back from Pi3. So there were several maintainers between Nikolai's time and when I eventually started contributing to Pi3 towards the end of 2019. And I suspect it was more just whoever was available and interested in working on it at the time. So I think probably what happened more was that Actix got bigger and bigger, and maybe he just didn't have the time to contribute to mm. Pi3 in the same way would be more my guess than I don't think there's any like watershed moment where it's like, right, I'm stepping away from this project. Okay. Because I mean, I'm just thinking like to Python, right? I, I believe there was quite a storm with Guido 
he's like, you know what? I'm kind of done. I'm still a user of Python, but I'm no longer going to be the BDFL, right? That's mm-hmm. what I was thinking, kind of what happened to him. He kind of just stepped back at the same time. So, you know what? This mm-hmm. is just too much. I'd rather just be a, a user and maybe commit some stuff once while I'm done kind of running or creating new things. So, obviously, that couldn't stay for too long. So, I guess Guido was the, the BDFL and I guess the, the ultimate authority on which direction Python goes. And he, he's still very much respected for that. And yeah, he stepped away, I think, probably was healthy for him and the project to just you know get some breathing room and and find a way for there to be a successor beyond because you can't have a bdfl just like run on it until the end of time and then suddenly you know the bus factor of one creates the serious problem for the project in the long run but so guido's back in the ecosystem now i think he's working maybe with microsoft i'm actually not too sure on that but he's been very involved as far as i know on python optimizations for like mm. python 3.11 and maybe slightly earlier versions as well but yeah so Sure, he could go step back, but he couldn't stay away for too long. Yeah. Well, I listened to his podcast with is Lex Friedman. Do you listen to that one? I'm not sure I have. It sounds like you maybe never heard of Lex Friedman. You might be right. <laughs> Unless I'm saying his name wrong. Oh, yeah. I'm awful at names of people, to be honest. So yeah. uh, this might be that I'm aware I of. I believe he's, he's a Jewish Ukrainian professor or associate professor in actually AI machine learning, if I remember correctly. Let me know if I'm wrong, audience. And but he interviews like everybody. And but I listened to him interview, both like James Gosling, who had helped create Java, and also with Python with Guido. It was very interesting. Mm-hmm. And they went actually quite in depth about how they managed to optimize Python and what was the way. So it was very interesting. So if you're interested in Python, you're interested in mm-hmm. deep tech stuff. They really get pretty deep because it's good because the host knows this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and he's already in AI machine learning, which I think Python is definitely the top or definitely one of the top two no way it could be top three it's gotta be top two i don't think it's uh, number I'd three probably shoot for saying that python is the number one i guess it depends maybe whether you're, yeah. you're talking about it from like a sort of the ultimate thing that it's built on or the research side because i think probably most machine learning researchers use python but maybe the final gpu models are probably built using stuff like c plus plus or maybe yeah well i mean once you optimize it right but like yeah python i mean I'm not too sure if I can say number one, but probably is. Now, the reason I say it is because you still have Julia and you still have R. Mm. Those three are for sure the biggest three that I can think of. Maybe you know more than me. I don't know what if you're in that space or not, but those three, I think, are the top three. I don't know if there's any others besides those three. Of course, you have yeah. C++, Rust now starting to get into that space. But, I mean, if you just look at the usage, right, those are the I top think three I can think of. Also, for research particularly, I think that you probably do need something that's a bit more flexible than the compiled languages for people just to pick up and play with so yeah i mean there's good arguments for using c plus plus and rust in the final production and um, sometimes it's helpful to have a prototype and yeah. like ultimately that's kind of why my interest is lying in both python and rust right but yeah because i used to work in data science like data analytics mm-hmm. stuff a long time ago before i got more heavy on the rust engineering i guess and um there was always the question at that time like is it python or is it r that's going to win the like the battle if you like and julia was like the new kid on the block that wasn't 1.0 that nobody was really even talking about at that point and so i think i would probably say that python's the the more established at this point i think there are still good uses for r it's but i think the, the general criticism was that r was very 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 good at the statistics but python was a bit better at the general purpose which has just helped its kind of like broader adoption julia so i've got some friends who have been very interested in julia at different times it's not something that i've personally tried with i understand it's got a couple of interesting choices like indexing from one rather than zero which makes it a bit like marmite is maybe that's a very british thing to describe it's like a food stuff where the, yeah. the standard quote is that you either love it or you hate it and so my understanding is that julia is much like that that either you really really like what it's doing or you're a bit like i just don't want to do this because it's too weird compared to what i'm used to yeah I know what you mean. I think I tried Marmite a couple of times. I didn't think it was so disgusting, but it wasn't so appetizing. <laughs> it's definitely an acquired taste, right? Marmite. I had some weird stat the other day that was like, maybe if you've had it before you were five or something, then yeah. you're more likely to like it. Otherwise, you're pretty much guaranteed to hate it, apparently. First I don't of all, know how true that UK is. food is like, I looked up popular UK food is like bangers and mash. I was like, okay. <laughs> Pies, but the pies are, of course, are very. I mean, they're different than the pie that I would think of. You know, pie for us is usually dessert. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah like a sweet you, pie. Your pies is like mm-hmm. steak and ale pie. It still tastes nice yep. for me. Mm-hmm. But like every time I talk to people, they're like, "Oh, there's no good food in UK." It's like, uh, mm-hmm. okay, 
And also the other thing I thought was very interesting was like, if we talk about food, right? I saw like top food in London or UK was like mm -hmm. some Indian dish. I was like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> I understand it's like masala. Yeah, your chicken masala or, or tikka masala or something like that. I was yeah. like, that doesn't really make sense. Wouldn't that be an Indian food? Why is this a top UK food? Is not what I'm thinking about when I think about UK food. So, so yeah, yeah, a takeaway curry is a very classic British cuisine option. I mean, I think it's something, especially chicken tikka masala. I think it's something that was put together a long, long time ago just for the Brits by Indian migrants who'd come over to you know, make businesses for themselves here and found that the Brits would happily buy it and it kind of caught on a cross country. I, I'm not an uh, expert on cuisine, so don't quote me too hard on this, but that's my understanding. It's not really a curry that's designed for anyone else outside yeah. of Britain. It's purely to sell to the Brits. We can go back to the, the machine learning stuff. One more thing I want to say about mm -hmm. Python was like, I always laugh because I'm just kind of a jerk like that. It's like, oh, you know, your Python is so good, you know, good at all these machines. And I'm just like, well, that's because it's using C underneath to do all this kind of stuff. If you did it in Python, straight Python by itself for most of this machine learning stuff, it would take you forever. Like mm. the power of Python for the stuff is, like you said, it's easy to prototype and change stuff. Mm. If you do everything in C, it would take you a long time, right? Yeah. I think like you say the word joke, but I actually think that that's probably a fair point. And I think it's actually one of Python's strengths because, and again, it's like Py03 is a, another kind of testament to that, that Python's got this flexibility, but it's got a nice syntax and it's sort of easy to play around with and prototype. But you can also actually do quite a lot of serious production heavy lifting using it because you've got these ability to tap into these native languages and they almost essentially feel, well, they are how the language behaves. And I mean, the Python interpreter itself is basically a big bundle of C code. And so all of the built-in constructs that you're using, you talked about list comprehensions earlier, like they're fast and efficient because they're actually implemented in C as the core of the language as well. And so, yeah, it really is. I guess, rather than being something that's like, oh, Python's not so great because it relies on that. It's, I, think, I kind of think of it as more like that's a fundamental of the Python philosophy that you can really reach to these other languages and get loads of stuff done using it. I seem to remember something I read somewhere. I, again, this is trying to remember. I think I saw somewhere, like in, somewhere in the Python docs, it says like, if you want to write faster Python, then or if your Python code is too slow, then rewrite it in C and hook it in. Like, that's what I think was mm. one of the suggestions. Is that something that you remember seeing too? Yeah, so I wouldn't be able to quote exactly on what the docs say, but certainly my perception on this as someone who's providing the ability for people to ship Rust code as a Python package is that the model that the, I guess, Python core team still think about is C as the API that they provide for people to ship native code. And the C as an API obviously is still quite a compatible thing because lots of languages can compile and interface with the C API. So then C++ comes along and there's lots of different C++ packages that you can use to basically build Python modules as well. And so those, I guess, oh, I've completely lost my train of thought there. So I guess th those modules are, yeah, they're not really like officially written to the Python documentation, but they still are like part of the ecosystem that I think people are, are talking about when they're making the Python language decisions. And I think with like PyO3 and Rust, I'm not quite sure that I'm really quite yet on the, the, the Python steering council's radar as to, you know, oh, when they're thinking about how the, the Python like C API should be shaped, like should we be considering Rust or like how we make it easier for Rust? Like we ha I have actually had one of the Python core devs come to the PyO3 repo and ask a discussion, but it was very like cursory early days. I don't think that it's something that's like, integrated into the whole philosophy of the documentation. It would certainly be something that I'd love to see happen. So, you know, if one day you go to the Python documentation on docs.python.org, I can't remember, is that the right domain? I think it might be. And you see like how to make your Python code go faster. So, you know, the, the C is the, the thing shipped by the Python team. And then maybe there's the C++ options and the Rust options. It'd be really cool to see those all stacked alongside each other in the Python official docs. Yeah, I, actually, this is a good kind of topic to get into is like, okay, I like Python. There's already a lot of stuff written in C that really needs to go fast. Like, when would I want to start to actually think about using Rust within my Python code? Like, is it just because I want to be cool? Or is there actually like a really good reason to look at using or adding my own Rust modules within Python? Maybe does that mm -hmm. question make sense? Yep. So I think that there's two main reasons that you would want to talk about it. And actually, it, it's kind of like there are three things that the Rust language kind of bases itself upon, right? I think it's been talked about a long time as like performance, 
correctness and multi-threading or safety. I feel like those are the right three. It's been a long time since I heard them. Um, but so for Python, I guess the multi-threading is not great in Python. I don't know if you heard about the global interpreter lock as a concept. Like you can only I'm really a Ruby have guy. One. I know all about the GIL. Is the GIL or GIL? GIL, right? They call it GIL. Yeah. Is that the same thing in Ruby? Yeah, the same. They have the same issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I don't know. I call it the GIL, I guess. Maybe you can I explain it a little bit more. I know you and I both know about this thing, but maybe not everybody mm -hmm. uses Python or Ruby. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're running an interpreted language like Python, well, specifically focusing on Python here, the point is, is that somehow you have to make all of your computer CPU code thread safe. Like that's just a thing that you have to deal with, especially in multi-threaded programming. I mean, modern CPUs, they have like four, eight, 12, 16 core counts just keep going up. Um, what is like a possibility if your program is not thread safe is that as you're manipulating the contents of the data stored in your different data structures, you'll end up with so-called data races, which can lead to your program basically giving incorrect results. And there's more complexities around multi-threaded programming than just that, but I think that's the one that I kind of anchor to first. Like badly written thread unsafe code is going to lead to results that you don't expect. And the global interpreter lock is Python's design on how to solve this problem that dates from a long, long time ago, where essentially CPUs were not very good at multi-core things. They may not have even been multi-core processors as like a generally available product when the global interpreter lock was first coined. And so what it does, it's pretty much what it says. It's a global lock that stops any other thread from running while the thread that holds the global interpreter lock is doing its stuff. And so pretty much any interaction with any Python data structure, you first have to take a hold on the global in interpreter lock and you just can't, it forces all other threads to wait. They have to ask for the global interpreter lock to be released by the thread that's currently got it before they can do stuff. And so Python just basically doesn't have a multi-threading story um, in pure Python code. And there's lots of work going on to explore different ways to change that. And it's an interesting direction for like the future of the ecosystem that maybe we can talk back on later. Like they're talking about things like how to do multiple Python interpreters in the same process, each with their own lock, or indeed the possibility of removing the lock completely, though that's more complicated change. That's also a discussion that's going on. So maybe in the future, we'll be having a very different conversation about Python and it's not like that. But as it is now, you can only really write effectively single-threaded Python code. And Rust, as we know, is very, very good at multi-threading because it's sort of designed around that whole thing, right down from the borrow checker to the way that it's designed with very, very good concurrency primitives in the standard library, it's touted as a good language for writing parallel code. And so that is one way that you can, I guess, introduce a little bit of speed up to your Python, but it's not really the main way, I would say. So jumping back to why you'd want to write Python, or Rust, sorry, in your Python code, performance is definitely a big option, but not necessarily for multi-threading because Python itself still being an interpreted language, right? There's a lot of overhead all the time. The interpreter's basically having to figure out dynamically at runtime, go down whatever steps it's taking to determine what the operation you're asking it to do is just using like the bytecodes of your script. But the compiled Rust code, there's a lot less overhead there. And so my rule of thumb that I like to quote is that if you just like naively take a Rust or Python function and you rewrite it in Rust, you kind of get like a three to 10 X speed up just for free. If just by replacing that function because you're cutting out all of the interpreted overhead. And so that's like a nice rule of thumb. And then you do get articles which talk about like results that are way, way off and like faster than that by some order of magnitude, but that's because they've then gone the extra mile and like gone, okay, we've got the naive Rust result and let's iterate on it and build it and make it faster and faster and faster. And then the other reason why I'd argue to rewrite Python code in Rust is for that correctness or reliability factor. So Rust's error handling is a really, really nice thing, I think, in my experience. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. The way that you deal with results and you basically are asked to handle them or pass them on at all cases, but it's done in a really quite ergonomic way is a really good thing for knowing when your program might fail. And you've got the possibility of panicking, sure, but that's kind of like reserved for cases that you don't really expect to hit ever in production anyway. It's kind of like, I guess, the, the dark horse of Rust errors. And there's some question about how you might integrate them with Python anyway, but that's an interesting topic if you want to come back to it later. Um, but Python is obviously the other extreme where you've got runtime exceptions all over the place. 
and there's not really any deep documentation on what you might encounter. Like a function might document what it throws, but it probably doesn't document what it calls might throw. And so you really get exceptions coming from everywhere, and it's quite easy to have crashes at runtime with Python that you don't expect. So by taking bits of your code that are even safety critical, you might not see a huge performance improvement, but you might see significant improvement to your reliability. And so those are the, the I guess, the two production reasons to look at why you'd move Python code to Rust. But then you also talked about, like, did we start Py03 because it's like cool and you want to do that? And I think probably there are quite a few people who come and use Py03 because they're familiar with Python. They want to play around with Rust. They kind of go with, okay, so I know how to build a Python project. Let's build a Python project because that's something I'm comfortable with, but I will also play with Rust at the same time. And so they can lean on the PyO3 user documentation as like their first foray into the Rust language sometime. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. I just feel like PyO3 is definitely a good way to hook people into the Rust ecosystem. And I think maybe you know this more than me because you've probably been doing a lot more Python than me. Like what would be like the biggest complaint about Python? Is it actually the runtime? Or is it even the errors that can come up, or is it a mixture of both? I guess it would be, yeah, I would kind of broadly say that the one concern that we've obviously talked about before is Python performance. Some people will dismiss Python because it's slow. And the other one, I think, is to do with runtime reliability because of both the way the error handling strategy is done. But I think often people often struggle with like distribution and packaging of Python programs as well. I don't know if you've ever had to fight virtual environments in anger. I guess for the context of the podcast listeners, when you're distributing Python code, you typically create an environment where you install all of the Python software that you're using into. And I mean, these have come a long, long way from back in the past where it could be quite difficult actually to set up a Python environment and install things like NumPy or Pandas that are very popular pieces of Python software. Like it, back in the past, you'd have to compile those on your machine as you're installing them into the the Python environment, and that could take quite a while and sometimes be an error-prone process. And that all kind of still creates potential runtime issues, where if your environment's not configured correctly, then you can get crashes in lots of different ways. And that's still, to be honest, something that we experience with PyO3 on the issue tracker like quite a lot. It's people who are trying to distribute Python in the many, many different ways that you can. Also, like PyO3 is also potentially making the problem more complicated in this case, because you can actually put the Python interpreter into a Rust program using PyO3. And so then it's a question of like, how is the Python interpreter that you've put into your Rust program going to load the different software from the environment that you've set up? And so there's lots of scope for stuff to crash at runtime because your environment is not quite set correctly. And if you're on like the Python standard happy path, if you like, where you're using a virtual environment in a way that's expected, these days you might well ship it in a Docker container anyway, so you can just install everything into the one environment in there. It can be quite straightforward, but you know you get people doing some pretty amazing, weird, and wonderful things. I find when you really look at the edge cases of Python distribution. Yeah, I just remember now the one other thing I really dislike about Python is yeah that when packages get installed, they're global basically, right? Yes, and you can only really have one version yeah. of a package in that environment. Yeah, Ruby's got this problem kind of solved. You can have multiple versions of the same package, but then you'd have to have this bundle file. So it's kind of like the virtual end. You're looking at me a little bit strange, but they saw that they have something called bundler. So they have a bundle.lock file that will get the right version for you. Where Rust, you have the local version already copied into your work space or project, right? So everyone solves it differently. But yeah, Python, they have this weird, it's, I've called it a hack. It is a little bit hacky, I think, right? If you look at the how it's all implemented. You're smiling because I think, is it because I'm, I'm being too simplistic or is that because I'm too correct? Yeah, I'm open to hearing. Just, uh, so by hack yeah. in particular, in this case, you're meaning about the fact that it's pretty much just... Yeah, I mean, you have to source this SH, this shell file, and like it's pointing to, I don't even know what it exactly is, but it, like you do have like your own kind of copy or pointing to like, it's like pointing to the global interpreter, but at the same time, like you have like these, like it points to, I don't know how to explain it. There's like a local files where all the packages get installed to. So it's called a yes. virtual environment, right? Yeah, you're exactly right, really, that the main Python interpreter and all of its core binary is deployed in the, like, the place you originally install it. And then the virtual environment contains just like a minimal subset of that, which is enough to support the virtual environment, plus pretty much all of the libraries that you want to install into that. And then so when you're running the Python interpreter, 
but you've loaded up your virtual environment. What's effectively happened is that it's set a bunch of environment variables so that when the Python interpreter is choosing what software to import, it's going to import it from that location preferentially over anywhere else on your system. And like, it's yeah. really easy to set different environment variables to change all of this. And you can have quite unexpected interactions sometimes if you've got different Python setups interacting with each other. As I said, I feel it's a little bit hacky, but I didn't really dig down into it, right? But this is just the way kind of Python works. And it's like, whenever I have a Python thing, okay, I have to install pip install virtual env. Okay, done. I've done Python for so long. Like I remember you'd have to do easy install first yep. and then use yep. easy install to install pip and then use pip mm. to install your stuff. So it was a little bit weird. Yeah, these days you could just have, I think it's pip installed by default, no? Yeah, pip is shipped by default. And it's not pip, but pip2, right? Very, very good. Pip2, not pip. This is a difference, I believe. I couldn't tell you. I think the versions on pip are now just done by date. So I think we oh, might yeah. be on like pip23.1 yeah, or something it's by quite this high. point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, now you mentioned Because we shipped over some notes to you and you put a couple of notes and I think it's interesting to talk about this part, right? Because you said all like a really good positive stuff and I definitely agree about what you're saying, but not everybody agrees, right? There is definitely some pushback and you brought up a great example of the cryptography network. To me, I hailed that as a win, but you had a couple of links. I just looked at the first one and looked at the other ones. But looking at the first one, it reminds me of an issue I had with another project where like, I added this project, this package to a Flutter project and it wouldn't build. And I was like, that's weird. And it took me a lot of time to figure out how to show the logs of what's going on underneath. Mm -hmm. And I found out it's exactly what this guy had on the error, which was that, oh, I need to have a Rust installed. Well, what the heck? So if you do it with <laughs> C, basically if, if you do it with C, pretty much nearly every developer is going to automatically have a C compiler installed, even mm -hmm. on Windows, right? But for Rust, it's like, it's not quite there where you're going to have it installed by default. And so people were kind of thrown off by that. Like, what's been like the, I don't know, you're in this more than me, so you probably hear a lot of flack from people like, why are you guys differing from using C? Or mm. like, what's, what's kind of the feedback? Yeah, so it's a great point of discussion, really. So Python as a package has, or an ecosystem has been around for a very, very long time. And as discussed, the Python interpreter itself, well, the C Python, Python interpreter anyway, there are several other flavors of Python interpreter out there like PyPy or one based on the JVM, Graal, Graal Pi, I think it might be called. I thought it was called Jython. Is Jython gone, or they changed the name? I think Jython might be... I actually don't know the history too much. I haven't looked into it that okay. hard. Whether Graal, the Graal VN implementation is its own one, or it's based on Jython, but yeah, there's Jython, or there's like Iron Python as well, which I think might have also been on the JVM. So there's lots of different flavors anyway. That's a diversion. But, but C is something that's very, very portable, and so you can end up putting the Python mm -hmm. interpreter on all sorts of different machines and like i guess a good example for is the raspberry pi where lots of people are used to playing around with python on on that small compile target and i think rust supports the raspberry pi as well but not every target that you can compile to with c can you compile to with rust so if you make the decision of choosing rust as your implementation language for a python extension instead of c then you are going to be limiting I guess, the very edge of the Python community from being able to use your package. And there might be reasons why you don't want to do that. So that is definitely a downside. Sometimes that, you know, that's a trade-off you've got to make. The argument in the cryptography library's case was that really they are focused on you know, security-based functionality. You don't really want to have risk of compromise to your security if you can avoid it. And so some of the members of the Python team or cryptography team there's a, a person on that group called Alex Gaynor, I think it said, and he's the security kind of expert, and he's put out white, like some papers and research into this. I think he was involved in Rust for Linux to some degree as well. He's got quite an interesting profile and all of this kind of stuff. But he made, or they as a group, were basically big proponents of using Rust instead of C in the cryptography for exactly that reason of soundness like they thought you know hey if this is something that's fundamental to the python ecosystem we want to build it in something that we feel confident shipping ourselves and so the argument against to those who were using platforms that were unsupported was hey i mean there are still older versions of cryptography that will continue to work for you but we're afraid that we don't feel we wish to support those as i think was the communication because the cryptography maintainers felt much more comfortable using a memory safe language where they were much less likely to make errors to really to ship. 
but so the backlash actually i talk about the, like the edges of the python ecosystem where rust doesn't actually compile to but there was also a backlash from people who were using i guess two old versions of python would be a way of describing it and so we spoke a little bit earlier about how setting up your python virtual environments you used to have to watch like numpy and pandas and all these things compile in front of you as you're building your python environment and so i don't have an exact date on it but basically the python wheel format is something that's basically very very common across the python ecosystem now and it's the compiled code downloaded straight to your machine for you so for all of your common os and cpu variants that you could think of you can basically just download the extension and run it straight away like for numpy pandas all kinds of things like this cryptography included you just basically don't ever have to do the rust compile on your own machine but if you had too old a version of pip or maybe you didn't have no that's the wheels only for download so it, if you had too old a version of pip then it wouldn't fall back to using the downloaded thing so you would be forced to run the compile and so it was people who maybe also just weren't keeping their systems up to date and the biggest message for them was hey just update your thing and it'll work just fine for you and you don't have to worry so yeah there is a, a small percentage of people who get cut out by the use of rust but for the most people they shouldn't even need to have a rust compiler in front of them for it to work yeah, I'm happy that we found ways to do this. This is Rust or uh, Python is not the only community that solved this problem. Elixir, I think, also has something. I think every community that's using Rust and even C stuff have managed to start to solve this. Somehow you get those compiled binaries, which is super fantastic, especially if you have a really crappy old computer, right? Mm. Yeah, I was just looking at the last one you had, the uh, last example C. Maybe I should kind of say, like, basically this guy had a very snarky comment about, you know, he used the words like, I want to congratulate the absolute heroes for blocking my employer's CI CD pipeline for two weeks. I mean, I understand it can be frustrating and you have this kind of issue and I feel for the guy, but this kind of message, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's not nice to have, right? I guess there's probably a better way to do it, but do you see a lot of these kinds of messages where people are adopting PyO3 and you have these kinds of responses? So not, to be honest, um, since that cryptography story. So I, I guess that really, cryptography uh, we've discussed about their motivations for why they chose to use rust and i think they probably were kind of leading the way as a large python ecosystem package i mean plenty of py3 packages have been shipped previously but maybe they were more for other pieces of, or kits or specialized uses so people wouldn't necessarily need them whereas people have been relying on cryptography for a long 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 time and so for the choice of that package in particular to make a roll over onto py03 and rust really like was the first time that i think a lot of the python ecosystem had to like acknowledge that this was a thing and so that's why it caught a lot of people out and so because there are increasing numbers of different packages which are popping up around the python ecosystem which have py03 in them now which is always very pleasing to see because of things like we've got pydantic v2 is out soon as i understand it and that is has a core implemented in rust now so that's going to be another large chunk of the ecosystem where they're used to interacting with, I think, I don't know whether Pydantic actually has anything like Scython or C or anything on it in the V1, but it's going to be a compiled package in the near future. Polars, I don't know if you've heard of this. It's like, there's Pandas, which has been around for a long time, and Polars is kind of an alternative implementation which has performance advantages. It's written in Rust, it's got a PyO3 wrapper. And so people are kind of getting increasingly, they're using all of these different libraries which have got py3 to sort of help them get the rust connected to the python and generally we don't see people saying oh what you know why is this done in rust like you know it's just creating headaches for distribution so it was really just like cryptography was the moment when it broke and there was a bit of pain and actually because well, we have like projects like this thing called setup tools rust which is what helps do the installation if you don't have the compiled package to download and you need to actually run the compile. And so, you know, we put quite a lot of work in with the cryptography guys around then to get error messages better as quickly as we could, because, you know, there was some kickback and clearly people were saying like, you know, we're confused. And so we tried to make it much more seamless. And so hopefully some of that work paid off as well. Well, I just want to step back to this comment and his comment at the end about, kind of mocked about the memory safety thing. I thought that was a little bit crazy, but then he replies back, you can mitigate this by getting good at C. I don't think that, you know, nobody is ever 100% good at C, I think. We had mm -hmm. an episode with the tour guys, or one of the tour mm -hmm. guys came on here, 
And the fact that even he is like, you know what, I really don't trust 100% what my code is, you know, it's going to be safe, right? To me, like, and that is huge. You know, a lot of these guys, I mean, not everybody is in that mindset, but there's huge implications if you don't get it right. And the fact that you're mocking about this, I think is the wrong mindset to have. I think it's just sour because it ruined his two weeks, right? Yeah, I think it was on a previous episode of um, Rustation Station, yeah. actually. I, I can't remember what exactly the discussion was on, but it was someone who said they would be perfectly happy working on a C project in isolation. You know, they thought they could deliver perfectly reasonable C code that would be performant and reliable for their own project. But what they weren't comfortable with was the idea of bringing multiple programmers into the mix, because then you have the boundaries and is everyone getting everything right between those interactions? And then suddenly you lead to memory errors that begin to make the whole house of cards fall down, if you like. And so I guess that, yeah, that that, that kind of discussion has been sort of gone on and on and on like you must hear it every episode pretty much of rustation station when you're recording that people are like yeah i mean c's got its merits and it's obviously gone through many many years and served us very very well but now when we're trying to build systems which are having more and more engineers interacting all the time like using memory safe languages like rust just sure you can write good software with c but you're going to make fewer mistakes if you also use the advantages that rust can give you um i don't know you had a an episode about Zig a little yeah. while ago. Is that right? Yeah. And so I heard a really interesting discussion about Zig recently as well. I think it's an article by, I don't know how to say this, Matt Cloud, the guy who does Rust Analyzer. Okay. Put out an interesting commentary about Zig and Rust recently. And it fell very much down the same lines, actually. I think the description that I took away from it, at least, like, don't misquote me on anything. because I actually haven't used Zig. I should probably jump by saying I've heard very good things about Zig. I don't have well, everything that I'm saying now is secondhand rather than firsthand experience. But the takeaway that I got from reading this article was that Zig is kind of like C V2, if you like. It's very, very powerful and has a lot of flexibility. You can do great stuff with it, but it's still kind of asking you to think carefully about what you're doing in a way that like you can probably write really fantastic pieces of code with Zig and it probably will have great fits where you'll achieve that kind of thing, it still doesn't quite have the defenses that Rust allows you. So maybe with Rust, you're forced to take slightly more inefficient paths because of things like borrow checker, meaning you can't write code in certain ways or things like that. But when you've got a big team of engineers all interacting, then maybe what you'll find is the effect is that while you could make nice units of Zig code, maybe with Rust, you can have like a bigger group all interacting without producing so many errors. But again, like I say, I haven't played with Zig first hand, so this could be an unfair criticism. No, I mean, that's a good point, right? It's kind of like, what are the risks? Because I think, I remember an episode, there's different levels you can compile your code in Zig. Mm. And so, yeah, but I believe there's also a safe version of Zig. So you get similar kind of robustness as you would with Rust. So yeah. I mean, the way I kind of look at it is, no matter how good you are, you're probably going to make a mistake at some point. And even if you don't, there's going to be another guy, right? The more people, the more likely there's going to be mistakes. And it just happens, right? Yeah, I absolutely. guess it depends on what kind of mistake you want to accept, right? If you're yeah. writing very, you know, the cryptography stuff, right? If you get one thing wrong, like the Tor guy came on, somebody can die, right? Mm. And even if you write it right, or no, how do I say that? Not even that. Like, somebody can die. Like, do you really want, like, is it really worth it? I mean, I don't know. It's crazy. Like, the, looking at those graphs about the uh, memory safety issues that, like, Microsoft put out, right? Mm. That's huge. And these guys yeah. are top programmers. Allegedly, or supposedly, right? Mm. So, I don't know. There's been a similar article, I think, now discussing Rust's use in the Android kernel, because it's shipped now, and I believe, if I recall correctly what they were saying, that maybe something like 15% of all native code, um, I can't remember the window it was after, but over, but let's maybe say last calendar year. It might have been 2022, or it might have been since the last uh, like Android release version, I can't quite recall. But something like 15% of it is shipped in Rust. And of the new bugs that had been released in the new code that had been shipped in that Android version, maybe, the vast majority of it was in that 85%. And not just like, oh, 85% of the bugs were in the other stuff, and then 15% of the bugs were in the Rust stuff. It was like the Rust stuff was really proving to be very, very reliable in the Android kernel. And that they were still facing the memory safety errors and all of the other classic stuff from the, the other 85%, which I think was predominantly maybe C, C++, 
I don't know if you're managing to pull that up right now. It looks like you might be. Yeah, I was trying to. If I remember correctly, because I actually did a presentation about this, I could have sworn I said there was no memory safety issue bugs in the Rust code that came up. Yeah, it might even be as extreme as that. Like, yes, yeah. they were very, very pleased to say that the Rust in the Android kernel was really proving a success. Okay, so this article is dated December 1st or 2nd. So it says in Android 13, roughly 20% of new native code is written in Rust. I mean, that's not a lot overall, right? Mm -hmm. This includes about 1.5 million lines of Rust code written in the Android open source project, AOSP. I'm not sure where this one is. Because they have components like Keystore 2, new ultra wideband stack, and DNS over HTTP 3 that you probably would have been written in C++. And so far, Rust has delivered, and this is a quote, to date, there have been zero memory safety vulnerabilities discovered in Android's Rust code. Hmm. Right, that's a huge claim. Again, it, this is December now; it's March. Right, I wouldn't be surprised if it's still zero because of what your guarantees you get. It will be very, very interesting as like time goes on to see you know, how long that stands the test of time. And I think that is obviously something that we know it's much, much more reliable. But is it really down to zero? You know, will there be one bug sneaking in there that we might find in a few years' time? That'd be an interesting thing to keep on top of if, if they're able to share that. Um, I guess we should maybe, looping back to Pyro 3, we seem to have gone a, a quite a long yeah. way from the core of that. So I don't know if there's anything particularly that would be interesting for you to hear personally about Pyro 3 in terms of like how it works or... Well, yeah, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about what I think is really interesting is, right, is everybody always thinks about, okay, this is my understanding because I've kind of seen some of this before, is mm -hmm. most of the time it's, okay, I'm Python, I'm calling into native C or native Rust. But Rust can also call, I'm guessing you can probably do the same thing, and C, but I know for sure you can call Python code from Rust. Mm -hmm. Like I saw an example where you can actually run the whole test suite of the Python code for your code in Rust. I was like, that's really crazy. Mm -hmm. Usually I'm thinking like you would compile it and then you would run your unit tests in Python because you would never go the other way around, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I guess, how would I describe that? So the Python interpreter has an API connected to it, the C API that we, we touched on a little bit earlier. And that's got a few different functions and way it can operate. So we've got the way in Pyo3 where you've got the extension modules, and that's sort of hooking into Python's import mechanism. When you ask Python to import a file, it can look at native compiled code that matches a name it's expecting and try and import native code from that. And it will run it where Python's calling you. But you can also, as you say, go the other way around. So the Python in interpreter has like they call it libpython. It's the compiled core, if you like, of Python. And the Python interpreter is a program that wraps that with just like a thin layer. But so you can also use libpython to basically create your own quote mark embedded Python interpreter, you like, or you can do Python -y operations the other way around. So you could write a Rust program, which like it links to any other system library and does stuff. You can make it start up a Python interpreter, start importing Python code. You can get it to compile that Python code and then run instructions. And so this is a mode for Pyo3 that I see fewer people doing because I think most people are interested in the case of, hey, I have a Python program, I need to add some Rust to it. But the use case for the other way around would be a bit like, imagine you've got a, a Rust program and you want to make a plugin system for it. You could make the plugin system implemented in Python. And so you just write your Python scripts. Maybe in that Python script, you have to make a function with a particular name or something like that and then the rust code would know how to load your python file and feed and drive that function effectively so you, you can do kind of those kind of tricks with it or sometimes you want to redistribute i don't know the python interpreter and just wrap it up in a particular way for end users there's different things that you could do with it um really it's it's down to what the python c api is offering and the functionality that's coming through libpython yeah i kind of feel like like a masochist if you want to call python from rust but I can understand that. I'm wondering if there's anybody who's like, you know how you can use Git to interact with SVN? Mm. I wonder if there's people who's doing like that. It's like, I'm writing Rust so I can interact with my coworkers' Python code because, you know, I don't want to write Python, I want to write Rust. I'm curious if anybody's mm. doing something like that. So I guess I'm quite likely to be doing that kind of thing because I use Pyo3, I've maintained Pyo3, but I've had this in a couple of cases just where like, maybe there's a Python tool which has been a bit easier to use because sometimes, I mean, the Rust ecosystem is fantastic, but there are still some like gaps in the implementation of the Rust ecosystem where it can be just a little easier to rely on other libraries. So I guess like the AWS 
bindings are potentially a nice example for this, where Amazon is increasingly supporting very, very well the AWS SDK for Rust, but I think it's still got some edge corner cases where it's not completely rounded out. But like back in the past, maybe you have like Python libraries like Boto3 is a way to interact with AWS S3 and like, okay, sure, S3's got a REST API. It's a very, very easy one to just interact with however you want. But one way that you could think about it is if you've got a particular Python library that solves a particular problem you need and there isn't yet a Rust implementation for it and you don't want to have to write your own, you could, if you wanted to, just you know write a piece of Rust code that uses Py3 to go call that Python function to do what you need. And that's definitely a complete inversion of like what most people might be wanting to use Py3 for, but I have seen that used in just occasional cases. Um, to be honest, I think uh, that really you you lose the advantages of Rust's typing if you do this, because you're basically just calling into a dynamic language and trusting that the result you get back um, is going to be what you expect. And what do you do? You have to crash at runtime if it's not. So we're back to all the reliability issues that we spoke about earlier. So it's not really the way that I, I like to think about code, but that, yeah, there are valid use cases why you might want to do this if you check carefully about what you're putting in and out of the Python function. Like I said, masochist. If you want to be a masochist, <laughs> that'd be the way to go. But yeah, like you said, there's valid cases. So I was just going to add that there's actually quite an interesting crate inline Python, it's called. And, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to use Rust's proc macro system to actually write Python co code, which at compile time, so as part of the proc macro, goes and asks the Python interpreter to compile that inline, that Python code to Python bytecode, and then embeds it into your Rust binary. So you can write like short snippets of Python code directly inside your Rust file and then execute them from your Rust binary later on. And so that's quite an interesting way to get like maybe a little bit of the stability of, of Rust, but still being able to use Python to write your syntax. It's something that I'd actually quite like to have maybe in Py3 itself at some point in the future, but sort of haven't committed to doing so yet. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's like it's done by at least some work done by Mara. So that's it's got something to it. It's got some some backing to it. It's interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I have a couple of people here that like to write Python. I'm not like, obviously you know my stance. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting. It's like okay, you do this part. Okay, I copy and paste the, the Python <laughs> code in there. Go to Stack Overflow, copy it straight into your Rust binary, oh, yeah. wrap it in inline Python, change a couple of the variables to do the stuff you need, and there you go, job done. Yeah. <laughs> Written the Rust program, but you were able to get the answer straight off Stack Overflow's Python section. Yeah, interesting. I should not tell people about this one. I feel this <laughs> too dangerous. So yeah, very much the uh, the model that I like to think of as Py3's biggest or like most interesting space to grow is certainly as the, the provider of Python modules. So getting the reliability of creating your Python module, call it with a nice Rust core, especially then from the Python side, obviously the typing doesn't really matter at runtime anyway, but you can have the like things like MyPy. I don't know if you're not such, such a Python fan, whether you've had to deal with Python's typing system much, because that's like, like a newer iteration. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've never tried it, but I've seen it. So it's kind of like an addition that is, helps with static analysis, but doesn't actually, for the most part, interact with the runtime of your program. Like you can query what the type annotations in your Python code are. So, you know, rather than just having like x equals five, you could write x int equals five, and kind of t in enforcing that you really expect it to always just be an integer. And that won't change your runtime at all, but you can you can verify it with something like MyPy, or there's a few different tools now for interacting with type annotations. But kind of what I was going to touch on by making this point is that interacting with PyO3 code is quite interesting because it doesn't actually have like Python syntax to read. So there's then a whole case of sometimes people ship type annotations alongside their Python or their PyO3 module. It's quite a common thing so that you can then still know what's in your Py in the native binary so that stack and stack analyzers can work with it. Maybe I've just jumped ahead and spoken a bit too far. No, I, I understand. I'm just thinking about that. It's, it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. There's also more than one static analysis tool. There's two of them, right? One by Microsoft and one, I think, by a part of the core team or something. Yeah, so MyPy and then PyLance, I think, is possibly the one you're thinking about by Microsoft yeah. and yeah. might be another one. Those are the two that I've mostly interacted with. But they both use the same system of that, the same like type annotation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the type annotations themselves are a standard part of the Python 
like poor language if you like the, they've gone through the pep process the python enhancement proposals and agreed on the syntax and how that should all work and so there's a typing library that's actually part of python standard library as well where you import yeah. certain annotations and and the syntax in general has been extended to permit all of these things and then yeah the, the static analysis tools themselves are not part of the python interpreter yeah, I feel like after a while, it's like, well, why am I even writing Python if I got to add type it, <laughs> types to it? I feel like I'm not mm. writing Python anymore, but it does help, right? People kind of realize that part. Yeah, I think actually I would go so far as to say that I'm really not a fan of writing produ production Python if I can't have type annotations, because it's just, again, it's another source of runtime reliability, which just have with Rust for free, obviously, because it's compiled, you need to have the types. With Python, you don't have to have the types, but I find that you're just so much more likely to create yourself a problem if you haven't got the type annotations. Yeah, I mean, this I mean, this is pretty cool. And, and a lot of people are talking about it. Like I said, I know quite a few people who got into Rust because of PyO3. They start with Python, ran into mm -hmm. some issues. Mostly, I think I hear about performance or like you said, safety or, you know, bugs happening or and I'm not, I wouldn't even say bugs, right? It's more like reliability of the code, right? Where they get weird things and then mm -hmm. they add it in PyO3 and then they're like, this is sweet. And then they're like, I want to do more. And then they, they just rewrote everything in Rust, which I'm not, I'm not pushing, right? But I think it, it's just what the progression, natural progression, I think. Mm. It's definitely nice to feel like we're able to give people that way to get into Rust without having to go wholesale and be like, right, how do I start a Rust program from the ground up? Like there's a tool called Maturin. I think that's how it's pronounced. I should probably really know that, but it's basically like there's Python packaging tools like Poetry, for example, which is quite well known. Or, I mean, we spoke about PIP and Maturin is kind of like, it's a friendly CLI for compiling your Rust code, integrating it with Python projects in a really nice way. If you've not had to deal with anything like Cargo before, Maturin will kind of get you most of the way. Like you still have to learn about how like the Cargo.toml works for dependencies and all that kind of stuff. So you have to dabble a little bit with it. And I mean, like, also Cargo is a really, really good tool. So there's not really a reason that you wouldn't want to use it. But if you're a Python user and you're kind of very used to like setting up your Python project in a Python-y way, Maturin is a really nice way to kind of think about things from a Python's sort of first perspective and do your Rust compiles and just like ease yourself in. So yeah, there's like a, um, a mature and new, just like cargo new, which will set you up a PyO3 project with the appropriate skeleton. And you get like a space to start adding your Python code and a space to start adding to your Rust code. And so it gives you a way to kind of just start and play around and see what happens. And, you know, like all programmers like to watch it compile, well, run or not run for a little bit and then eventually figure out what you're doing and really build from there. I'm just happy to work with Rust where now we have a time to do something else. It's like code compiling, you know, that famous <laughs> X, XKC, CBD, whatever that is. Mm. Go play some ping pong and make a coffee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I, I don't think I have any more questions about PyO3. I think it's already quite famous enough, but it's good to kind of get you on. Is there something yeah. else that you wanted to, to say about PyO3 before we, we, we sign off? We already have quite a bit of time together. I think we've probably had quite a long episode. The, the listeners might be getting tired by this point. And so maybe it's best not to go on too much further. But uh, it, yeah, it's just, um, I guess if I was sort of round it off, I think it's a really exciting project. I mean, I've, I've been pretty involved with it for three and a bit years now at this point. And I, I hope to continue to, to add to it and see it become more of a part of the Python ecosystem for, for years to come. Um, I kind of have this like long-term dream that maybe, you know, like there are sort of like scientific Python libraries like NumPy and SciPy and Pandas, and they all kind of like integrate with each other. And they have, you know, it, it uses the benefits of how C you can include different header files and interoperate at that way at the library level. We, ha we haven't got that far with Rust, you know, like Polars and Pydantic and cryptography and all of these libraries are independent at the moment, but it'd be so cool if in the future we had a, a whole ecosystem of Rust code, which like in unison, bubbled up to be a Python layer. So rather than being individual packages, more like a, a network of things that could all talk to each other at the Rust level as well as the Python level. Yeah. And so that's kind of like the, what I hope for the future of PyO3. Don't know how many years it'll take to get there. Yeah. Have you gotten Guido's sign off approval about saying this is a nice project? Just curious if he's ever said anything about it. I I don't know, actually. That's a great question. I don't think I've seen any written communication from Guido on PyO3. It'd be really interesting to hear what Guido's opinion of it is, like whether mm -hmm. it's like, mm, we should be sticking to C as the extension module language or whether it's like, yeah, okay, we can support other APIs. So I have no idea. 
I'm just imagining him saying, maybe you should just, because you know Dutch people are very direct, right? So maybe he'd just mm. say, maybe you should just learn to write better C. I don't, I don't approve of this. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, if he did say that, would that, would that like tear you down or you, you would just say, oh, I don't know if I really like Guido very much anymore. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious what your thought would be. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'd be disappointed to hear that. But at the same time, you know, I think there will continue to be people who want to write Rust code for for various different reasons. Um, and so it's nice to be able to give them that opportunity to interface with Python as well. Um, and I think, yeah, while obviously Guido has a long history as a very influential person on the Python ecosystem, I would hope that you know, one person's put down on Pi 3 wouldn't be enough to kill the project stone dead in one go. Yeah, no, but it, it, it'd just be interesting to hear what he has to say. I, I'm guessing, mm. you know, any way that you can keep, uh, you know, keep the enjoyment of Python. I mean, in general, right, you, the reason that you're trying to extend it is because you still love the language and you just want to find a way to solve some of the things that just don't, don't match up. No language is a perfect language, I would say, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, I guess, looping back to the beginning a bit, it's really easy to start writing code in Python and see what's going <clears> on and get feedback and just experiment in a way that you can do so in Rust, but it maybe requires a little bit more careful thought ahead of time because you have to get the compile to work and all of that. So by giving people the opportunity to, who prefer to work in that first mode, the Python layer, but you know, knowing that there's nice solid performant Rust underneath is quite a good kick and i guess actually just thinking just touching on that as well like the efficiency in like um i guess not not being wasteful with system resources like you're having an interpreter language has a lot of advantages but where we can cut away the interpreter overhead and make it compiled and just a bit less wasteful and run a bit faster is quite a satisfying thought too yeah definitely okay again thank you for coming on and i'm happy to finally have somebody on for pio3 i haven't been looking but that definitely was on my list before you reached out so i'm happy we could get somebody on to talk about it yeah it's been a real pleasure thank you very much for having me on mm -hmm.